enhancing connections with the global neighborhood through expanding partnerships. My name is Connie Rinaldo, and I'm from the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard, and the, I'm also chair of the Biodiversity Heritage Library. My co-moderator is Colleen Funkhauser from the Biodiversity Heritage Library. She's the program manager. Ellie Wallace is the, is the Zoom admin for this session, and hopefully we won't have any issues. The session will be recorded. So thank you for joining us. And I, I really wanna thank all the speakers who've agreed to talk about various um, really interesting topics. Um, we are planning for 15 minute talks with five minutes for questions after each talk. Um, you, can, you, can put, you can use the chat, it's open, um, but please keep your microphone phones muted unless you raise your hand and I call on you or um, when the question sessions, the five minutes of question sessions come up, you can, you'll be able to do your own microphone. So the BHL has been completing their current um, strategic plan for 2020 to 2025. And today you'll hear about some of the exciting um, plans that we have and accomplishments as well. Our first speaker today is Alyssa Herman, and I will let her introduce herself. Um, she will be talking about building the Biodiversity Heritage Library's technical strategy. Alyssa? Ah, there we go. Thank you. Sorry, it was a bit different than we tested it just a few minutes ago. <laughs> That's always the case. I just, I thought maybe I had, you know, zoned out or something. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> okay, well, um, yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the session. Um, and thanks, Connie, for the introduction. Um, as mentioned, my name is Elisa Hermann. I'm head of library at the um, Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. And the museum became a full member of the BHL in October 2018. Since then, we have aligned our digitization strategy um, for the library holdings with the availability of the titles in the BHL. So the Biodiversity Heritage Library is a very important infrastructure for us as a library, but it is also a um, well-known and respected tool for our researchers. And um, therefore, we are very interested in the further development of the BHL and try to get involved into the um, development of the strategic plan for 2020-2025. Um, the new strategic plan focuses on five goals. Um, I'm just going through them. Um, goal one is about the relevant content. So we want to grow the BHL into the most comprehensive, reliable, um, reputable repository of biodiversity literature and um, for other original materials as well when we think of archives, for example, um, to support the global challenges. Goal two aims to create services and tools that facilitate uh, discovery of BHL content to improve research efficiency um, for all potential users. The work in goal three, user engagement, will increase the global awareness about the BHL and the biodiversity issues in general to inform existing users and attract um, new user com communities. Obviously, our goals can only be accomplished as a joint effort, and therefore we are looking in goal four for new consortial partnerships and alliances to foster cross-institutional collaboration. And finally, in goal five, we want to ensure that um, the mission and the success of, of the BHL is enabled by increasing the financial strength, effective administrative support, and organizational excellence. So this is a lot of effort for the next five years, and why are we doing this? Um, our vision is to inspire discovery through free access to biodiversity knowledge. And as we see, um, and we see our mission in improving research methodology by collaboratively making biodiversity literature openly available to the world as part of a global biodiversity community. With this mission in mind, it was important for us to address the needs of the biodiversity community in the best possible way. So when we developed the strategic plan, one orientation for us were the goals that were outlined during the last um, Biodiversity Next conference. 
it's um the vision is better data better collaboration and better science and we try to achieve this by um, active policies to support open access open data and open science we need more content for open access use and reuse we need to develop new and also improved tools we need um, appropriate funding and governance to make our work sustainably available and uh, we need to increase the partner participation as well as um, better integrate with the biodiversity community um, besides this needs from the community, we also um, observe the global social and technological challenges um, uh, that influence our actions and that have a big impact on our existing and potential users and partners. And in this presentation, um, I'm going a bit more into detail into the uh, second goals um, to enhance the tools and services. Um, in this goal, we have five objectives. One is we want to improve the global awareness of um, and the accessibility of the BHL. We enhance the machine readability of BHL content for data reuse. To keep up with the technical development, we need uh, clear priorities and leadership for, technical, for the technical infrastructure. And to achieve the plan and make the infrastructure sustainably available, we need to identify um, resources. And finally, and the starting point for this strategy is the implementation of the BHL 2020 Technical Priority Plan. So we're, um, let's have a closer look at these objectives. Um, to enhance accessibility and probably also to enhance awareness, we're looking for the implementation of, of a responsive design to improve the reusability for mobile devices. Um, over 50% of all website accesses in 2019 came from mobile phones and tablets. Um, I guess everyone's using them now in their everyday life and also researchers are more and more using this technology for their work. Um, for example, in home office, but also when they go um, into the field. And this brings us to the next technological challenge that we're facing, remote areas and areas with low bandwidth. Um, I give you an example, um, 4G, so the fourth generation of broadband cellular network technology, is only available in 70% of um, the area of Germany, uh, compared to the USA, where it's um, available in 93%. So if I go outside of um, Berlin, for example, into fields, um, it's pretty much, well, it's pretty sure I won't have any um, access to fast internet connections and um, access resources like the BHL. So um, facilitating the infrastructure in remote areas um, is of interest to us in Berlin <laughs> and um, also to new potential BHL partners and, and users in, in similar or even worse situations. Um, one solution here could be Docker images for our tools like Macaw that we use for uploading content into the BHL, but also REST APIs and um, the implementation of the IIIF viewer that will facilitate the um, image delivery. To ensure that the biodiversity community knows about the BHL, we are reaching out to different communities as we are presenting the BHL in conferences. Um, we publish um, about our work. Um, we do social media um, communication. Um, obviously, this task is strongly linked to Goal 3 user engagement, but um, it is our task to, to support um, the effort there. As our users and partners are all over the world, um, we want to improve the multinational usability, um, for example, by using multilingual interfaces and search functions. We would like to add language synonyms. Um, for example, if you're looking for lion in, in German, um, you will also get the results for lions in um, other languages. And we'll also offer uh, training material and information material in different languages like Spanish, French. Um, currently, we're working on German materials to attract new users and partners as well, to inform them about um, the work we're doing and how we can support them. If you're interested in this topic of multinational usability, I highly recommend um, the post from Lydia Ponce de la Vega that was published on the BHL blog um, in September. Um, the link is uh, in the presentation. I'm, if you're interested, I can also um, put it in the chat. Um, obviously, there is a need to derive more information from our collection and um, also for deeper metadata passing, which we try to support through 
text analysis um, using our OCR or transcriptions. Currently, you can search for taxon names, but we're also thinking about geographical names or um, other information that are relevant for researchers, for example, for climate changes. Um, as I'm talking, you can see that uh, our to-do list is growing rapidly <laughs> uh, to support our technical team and to bundle different um, expertise on these topics. Uh, we're planning to, or we would like to explore alternative technological development models um, with third parties, for example, in, in hackathons or competitions or, or workshops. Um, which leads us already to the data reuse. Um, one step here will be the improvement of the existing OCR content, but also to generate new OCR or metadata with the support of our users. Um, when we think of uh, crowdsourcing transcription projects or social tagging approaches, that again will help us um, with the deepened metadata parsing. Um, with our users always in mind, uh, we will create a five-year technical roadmap to enhance the user experience, for example, by um, organizing inspirational workshops uh, like we did last year in Berlin for the digitization of the museum collection. We could also do this for the um, development of the BHL and ask target groups or stakeholders um, for their feedback and ideas on how they would like to reuse our data and what tools and services they need from us um, to support them. Also task here is to enable the reuse of our content by providing tools like um, the REST API or by linking our data in other repositories. Um, this, by the way, doesn't necessarily um, mean databases you know from the biodiversity community, but also from library science, uh, library community, as our data is um, available in the um, OCLC WordCut database, for example. But here we also have to be um, <clears throat> or to enable the reuse, we also have to be a bit more transparent and give um, information about our data, for example, by clarifying the digitization criteria so that our users will know what kind of data they are um, using. Um, and of course, the user experience goes hand in hand with the expectation from the community they have from other infrastructure. Um, so we want to apply best practices in digital library and bioinformatics um, development. Uh, we haven't decided on which ones um, and probably we'll conduct a landscape study first. But then again, I think in five years, I expect a lot of development and changes in this field. So it may not be uh, important to define them now, just to keep in mind that we um, always check for the latest um, developments. And this brings us all, uh, to the next questions and how we will achieve all of these goals and objectives. Um, we're, looking, we're looking for collaboration with other digital library projects um, to join strengths and efforts and basically to not reinvent the wheel. And we're also trying to identify sources um, of external funding from other initiatives, institutions or private donors. And, uh, whoops. Last but not least, um, I mentioned the uh, priority, uh, the technical priority plan earlier. Um, that does already include some of these um, goals, like the implementation of the IIIF. You are, um, we're also working on the integration of the nodal metadata into BHL metadata repository, and to enable the cross search between between BHL and the nodal. Uh, further task where the automatic integration of content from pens of publishers. Um, uh, where we use the open access um, journals from the Museum for Naturkunde um, as an example to set up the process. And the focus this year was also on the global names architecture as well as on the DOIs. Um, I'm not going into detail on this here, as you will hear about this just after my presentation. So there is a lot of work ahead of us for the next five years, but um, our motivation and well, call it ambitions, um, come from the feedback of our users and the biodiversity community who already see the BHL as a free mobile archive for natural history literature and um, think that the BHL is idea for 21st century research, which um, can happen on field in a museum um, at a coffee shop as long as there's internet connectivity. We talked about this earlier. Um, so I think this is great feedback and keeps us um, doing um, and, and striving for, for, for better solutions. And naturally, we want to uh, continue to do justice to this. 
So this was just a short introduction of a um, big plan and um, how we want to build the technical strategy as part of the BHS strategic plan. And if you have any questions now, I'd be happy to answer them or try to answer them now. Otherwise, um, hmm, I thought my email address was on the slide. Anyway, um, I try to answer them now. Otherwise, you have the uh, communication channels of the BHL and um, feel free to contact us anytime there. Yeah. Thanks, Nisa. Um, we have five minutes for questions if anyone um, has any. And you should be able to unmute yourself in this at this point. And we do have one question so far in the shared google.com. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm getting there. <laughs> okay. Should I um, stop sharing my screen? Uh, you could stop. You can stop sharing your screen okay. if you like. For the multilingual challenge, is it possible to think about integrating or reusing the information in different languages and wiki data? Um, I'm aware, for example, for Lion, there's already much information in different languages already in existence. And this comes from Siobhan Leachman. Right, um, so we're looking for different resources. Um, Wikidata would be one option. Um, there are also, um, I guess, databases or data from the European um, library projects like Europeana, they had the same problem with the um, multi-language um, usability. Um, so yeah, Wikidata would be one resource we're, we're looking into. Um, we're also looking for indigenous uh, dictionaries um, to, to, well, pay justice to, to a variety of, of languages, not just the main languages. Another question that came in is, would it be helpful to try interconnection with the Hathi Trust Library from Dimitri Mazarin? Right, um, the Hathi Trust Library is on the list for the collaboration with other digital library projects. Um, so far we haven't been, oh, just correct me if I'm wrong here, but we haven't really been into communications with them now. Um, the strategic plan was just finished um, summer this year, so we were we're just at the beginning of the of the book here. But um, they're definitely on the list as corporations. And we have a, a comment um, from Dimitri Mazarin. We probably can make vernacular sim synonyms next year via glo the global name service. That would be awesome. Brilliant. I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and Dimitri Siegel just Googled the new strategy and said it was very nice and compact, great key direction and user oriented is great. Thanks, Dimitri. Well, thank you. I can watch these questions coming up. It just takes a little, <laughs> little time as they come. Um, Have you considered implementing annotations as part of the IIIF implementation? That's a question I think Joel may be, um, be the expert to answer that. So I'm not very much into the implementation of IIIF. Maybe we can hold that question for, for um, the third yeah. session, the third talk. Um, I'm just waiting for some things to be completed <laughs> in the document. They're, they're coming fast and furiously, but they aren't finished. So um. Um, this is Martin. I'll just jump in with the annotation answer. <clears throat> yes, we're looking at all the different functionality that you have available through IIIF and annotation is one of those things that um, is on the um, planning list. And Deb Paul asks, how about people names, similar to finding taxon names and connecting to bionomia? Yeah, I guess that's 
probably even more important than the geographical names, but um, definitely on the, um, yeah, it's a good idea to, to add that on. And then Cambridge Digital Library has worked with BHL in the past, but I'm not sure if there's ever been work with the embedded libraries across the University of Cambridge, botanical, zoological, college libraries, et cetera. Do you know if, if there are conversations going on? Um, I've been asking at this end, but none of the collections I know have, have been part, part of any conversations. But I can't see who that's from. It just, <laughs> there's no name. <laughs> oh, there it goes. Lauren Gardner. <laughs> Um, that's something we will have to follow up on. Um, we're not currently open to, we're, we're currently working on new partnerships, but we've been um, kind of slowed down by world events these days. Okay, I think actually we've reached, um, we've reached the end of the time for this. Keep your questions coming. We can come back to them at the end. Um, but I'd like to move on to Nicole Carney. Good morning, everyone. I'm Nicole Carney. I'm speaking to you today from Melbourne, Australia. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about historic literature and how easy it is for that, his that literature to get lost. And I'm specifically gonna talk about lost platypus in that literature and what we've been doing at BHL to rediscover those lost platypus and to make sure that they never get lost again. Last year at Biodiversity Next, I spoke about how important it was for us to bring that historic literature into the modern linked network of scholarly research. And how if we want that historic literature to be discoverable, persistently citable and trackable, how it has to have digital object identifiers or DOIs. I concluded my talk at Biodiversity Next by saying that there were three key things that we at BHL need to do in order to bring that historic literature into the modern linked network. Three things to turn the unknown knowns on BHL into known knowns. We need to add article level metadata to all articles to make these articles discoverable, not just within BHL, but via external search engines. We need to assign BHL DOIs, our own DOIs to articles on BHL to make these articles persistently citable and trackable. And we need to add existing DOIs to article data on BHL, particularly when the DOI versions of those articles are behind paywalls elsewhere. I spoke at length at the Spinach and Tadwig meeting in Dunedin in 2018 about how commercial websites are taking out of copyright literature, assigning DOIs to it and putting it behind paywalls on their own websites. I spoke last year at Biodiversity Next about how we at BHL are working with Unpaywall to make the free versions of our articles on BHL accessible via those DOIs. If you wanna know more about this, Rod Page and I wrote a blog post on the BHL blog last year explaining exactly how we're making BHL journal articles discoverable via Unpaywall. And today I'm gonna to talk about the things that we've been doing over the past year around these three big tasks. I manage the Biodiversity Heritage Library project in Australia, and like most BHL operations, we haven't been able to do much scanning in 2020. But this has given us an opportunity to look at the data that and, the, and the content that we've already put on BHL and make it more discoverable. Those of you who've heard me talking about my BHL Australia staff, and particularly our BHL Australia volunteers, will know that there's no stopping them. When I sent our team home in March, two of our most incredibly enthusiastic volunteers, Bob and Heidi Griffith, got in touch with me and said, is there anything we can do from home? Is there any way that we can continue to contribute to BHL during lockdown? And so I got in touch with Rod Page. Now, those of you who know Rod Page and the extraordinary work he does, know that he goes and gathers article level metadata from all over the place, from a whole lot of different sources, and he uploads it into BHL via Biostore to make articles discoverable in BHL. And so I wrote to him and I said, are there any titles, journal titles that you have that you haven't been able to articleize in BHL, either because the data is missing or because it's too messy or incomplete? And so he's been sending me lists of titles and I've been sending them to Bob and Heidi Griffith. And during lockdown over the last seven months, they have either manually gathered from scratch or cleaned up 
article level metadata for over 30,000 articles that were in BHL already but weren't discoverable because they didn't have article level metadata. So thanks Bob and Heidi Griffiths so much for that incredible work and thank you Rod Page. I'm going to talk about just three of those 30,000 articles, three lost platypus. The first from the Proceedings of the Zoological Society of London. Now this is an article that's very important to me because the Proceedings of the Zoological Society of London have put all of their back issues, even those that should be publicly accessible, behind a paywall on the Wiley Online Library website. And every article on Wiley has a DOI and that means that their versions are the definitive versions that everyone else must cite. But when I looked for this platypus article on their website, I had a lot of trouble finding it and not just because they charge for access. I couldn't find it because the only metadata attached to that DOI was the date and the person who chaired the meeting on that date. So they've assigned DOIs at the meeting level, not at the article level. And so all of the papers that were read at those meetings are not discoverable because they haven't included that data. They haven't included article titles or authors. This is the Outmetric wheel for that article on the Wiley website. Now Outmetric uses the DOI to gather data about use, citations and sharing of articles. And this Outmetric wheel is blank for this article. Zero users, zero sharing, zero citations ever. So Bob and Heidi Griffith went back through every article in the Proceedings of the Zoological Society via the BHL website and they collected that article level metadata authors, titles, page numbers, and the links on BHL where each of those articles started. And they found that, at that just at that one meeting, June 28th in 1859, there were 15 articles that were presented at that meeting and subsequently published in those proceedings across a whole range of zoological taxa. None of those articles have been discoverable before, discoverable before either, either on the Wiley website or via Google or other search engines. But they are now discoverable on BHL because we've added that article level metadata. And so our platypus is no longer lost. The second article I'd like to talk about is this one from the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. Now this illustration isn't as beautiful as the last one, but it is incredibly significant because that's a mammary gland. This is the article in which Richard Owen concluded that this weird creature that lays eggs is indeed a mammal. All of the back issues of the philosophical transactions are on the Royal Society's website and they've assigned a DOI to each one, making their versions the definitive versions that everyone else must cite. They've included the titles and the authors for each of these articles, which would make these articles discoverable. And this one would be discoverable if it weren't for the spelling mistake in the scientific name. Now that's an OCR error. The optical character recognition software that they're using has picked up that faint H in Ornithorhynchus and it looks like an L followed by an I. So you would only find this article either via Google or via their website if you were searching for Ornithorhynchus. If you were searching for Ornithorhynchus, you wouldn't find it. That's the outmetric wheel for this article. Again, it's blank. No sharing, no citations, no usage ever, which is a shame because this is a hugely significant article. They have a disclaimer on their website saying that their data, the article data, is gathered, harvested from scanned images using that optical character recognition. And they ask if people find mistakes to let them know. So I have let them know and they got back to me just yesterday saying that they'll go ahead and fix this error now. But I wouldn't have even known this article existed if I hadn't known to look for it because I knew it was on BHL. This is that same article on BHL and this is the OCR that our OCR software has picked up for this article. And I was really excited to see that our OCR has accurately picked up every letter in that scientific name. And that that means either our scans are of better quality or our OCR software is better quality um, or both. And that's really exciting because that means that our taxonomic name recognition is able to recognise both Ornithorhynchus and Ornithorhynchus paradoxus as scientific names that were mentioned on that page. I'm not going to talk about taxonomic name recognition anymore, even though it's one of my favourite things about BHL, because Joel Richard is going to talk all about it just after this. And there are those two scientific names. So we've now put all of this article level metadata on BHL, which means that that article is now discoverable within BHL via external search engines, via the title and the author, and also via the DOI. We've included the DOI in our metadata because we have a responsibility to do so. The DOI is part of the bibliographic metadata for an article. If one exists, you need to include it in every citation. So our DOI, their links out, their, their DOI that we've included in our website links out to the definitive version on their website. 
The third article I'm gonna talk about is probably or arguably the most important platypus article of all from the naturalist Miss Slaney published in 1799. This is the article that introduced the platypus to the world. It's its very first published description and that is the first published illustration of this species. The naturalist Miss Slaney has over a thousand scientific descriptions of animals that were sent to London at the end of the 1700s and early 1800s. But they're really hard to find those scientific descriptions, both in the physical versions and online, because these volumes have no page numbers. And up until really recently, there was no article data and no DOIs. This is Chris Healy, who's the digitization technician for BHL Australia. He usually digitizes our rare, rare books for us. He has also been working from home for the past seven months, creating tables like this. He's collecting article data, meta, metadata for us. And in the case of the Naturals Miss Laney, he had to collect all that data from scratch. And that was such an important piece of work because the Naturals Miss Laney contains so many of the most iconic species in Australia. So the first description ever of any species of kangaroo is in this publication, along with our other egg laying mammal, the echidna, and many of our birds, such as this beautiful budgerigar. We've started to upload the article data for those volumes onto BHL. We've just done two volumes so far, which include that platypus. And this is the first description of the platypus now discoverable via an article metadata page on BHL. And I'm so excited to announce that that first description of the platypus now has a DOI, a BHL DOI. And this means that this is the definitive version that everyone else must cite. Everyone now who cites this first description of the platypus needs to include the DOI in their citation. And that will point to this page on BHL. This is the out metric wheel for that platypus article. It's already looking pretty impressive. It has had a DOI for three weeks since the 1st of October. And if you click through to look at that, um, that out metric wheel, you can see that it's mentioned on a blog. And that's the BHL blog. Thank you to Grace Costantino for going back and retrospectively adding that DOI to the citations on the BHL blog. There are four blog posts that BHL has published that mention that first description of the platypus. It's also now mentioned on four Wikipedia pages. Thank you to my friends at Wikipedia, Siobhan Leachman and Mike Dickerson who helped me to add those. And that DOI has been tweeted or retweeted by 104 unique users on Twitter. And those users have a reach of over 434,000 followers. So that's really exciting in three weeks. It's gonna get bigger and brighter that rainbow wheel. When I first tweeted about the first description of the platypus getting a DOI, we got a pretty excited response from our online community. They said, both the idea of this DOIs for all and its actual content are absolutely brilliant. The description of the platypus is just fantastic. It's good to know that an article published in 1799 can be assigned a DOI. Links like that are essential for citations and cross-referencing. Now we need this for every other species in order to finally get non-taxonomists to cite our taxonomic papers. Now, if only people would properly cite the taxonomic work that is the foundation of their research. And this final one made me chuckle. Well, that'll do wonders for the author's H index. Now, George Shaw doesn't have an H index and he doesn't have an ORCID, but he does have a Wikidata ID. And that allows us to persistently link him to his publications. And you can do that via Wikidata and via Scolia. And there's the duckbill platypus there connected now persistently to George Shaw. And using, using, Scolia, using Scolia, you can also track citation statistics. Now those counts are all at zero now because these are new DOIs, but now everyone has to use them. So those counts are only gonna go up. So watch this space. And you can also do some really cool visualizations on Scolia and that is George Shaw's co-author graph. And I really love playing with these. If you haven't had a chance to have a look at how Scolia and Wikidata work, I really encourage you to go and have a look. Those orange ovals there are the women that he's co-authored with, BHL and a lot of BHL's users and a lot of Wikipedia people, again, like Siobhan Leachman are really interested in the women in our history. And so this allows us to persistently connect them to their work and their co-authors. We also have identifiers for authors on BHL, which allows us to connect them to their publications. This is George Shaw's publication list. You can see he has, there are 11 books on BHL that are, that are written by George Shaw and currently 85 articles. Once we upload the full list of the 1000 articles that we've got DOIs of article level metadata for, that number is gonna go through the roof. Two minutes. Nicole. And what's really exciting is that we can now add Wikidata IDs to those authors, which means that we can persistently identify them and we can also do some really important disambiguation work in the back end of BHL. 
And I'd also like to emphasize how easy it is to add citations to Wikipedia if those citations have DOIs. They have this automatic add a citation box where you can drop in a DOI, it automatically generates a beautifully formatted citation. It's much easier to add a citation if it has a DOI. So we need to add DOIs to all our articles in BHL to encourage Wikipedians to add them to Wikidata. No, oh, sorry, and Wikipedia. And that's why the DOIs exist. They make it easy to find, cite, link, share, and track scholarly content, whether that scholarly content was published today or 200 years ago. This final platypus article I'm going to mention was published just last year. It's a historical insight into population changes of the platypus. And the authors state that evidence for decline in abundance and distribution is critical to mapping those changes. And that evidence is only possible to be gathered through the inclusion of historical information. There are 58 million pages on BHL, 58 million pages of information about the world's biodiversity. If we don't make it discoverable, or those pages discoverable and easily linkable, that information is in, at risk of being lost. So we need to add DOIs. And that's why we've started this brand new Persistent Identifier Working Group. So we met for the very first time last week, but the people on this page did a lot of work in the lead up to that meeting. And I'd like to thank Mike, Susan, Joel, Bess and Rod for all the work thus far and all the work to come. Our job is to bring that historic literature into the modern linked network of scholarly research. So stay tuned because we have only just begun. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Nicole. If anyone has any questions, we have five minutes for questions. Just perfect timing. I'm going to head to the Tadwig doc to the uh, document and see if anything's come up. Uh, one question was, "What's the OCR software that BHL uses?" And Martin answered, um, Julie Shapiro. Uh, that BHL uses a, the latest Linux version of Abbey via our Internet Archive partner. But Elisa is, Elisa Herman, who spoke earlier, is helping with some new thinking for that. And there's more information. There's a, a blog post listed here, or an about post listed here that you can find. Thank you for um, answering the question, Mom. <laughs> Dimitri Siegel noted that listening to Nicole, I suddenly recall a discussion at AGU in 2019 when somebody wondered if data set DOIs can be hierarchical of parent-child relationships. I think the content was hierarchical sampling with data set of data sets. For instance, the society meeting DOI can be apparent to DOIs of articles read at that meeting. This is not a trick question, I, I don't know but maybe Wikidata Scalia links can make these kinds of connections too. Following this logic of making connections among identifiers, one day we'd be able to assign IDs to occurrences in all of those 58 million pages. That wasn't really a question, but what a great comment. I can tell you we're adding hierarchical DOIs as well, because in order to add DOIs to those articles in that old publication, we had to have a DOI for the publication itself. So that was hierarchical. The title had a DOI and then the articles also had DOIs. And we had to do that because that title didn't was too old to have an ISSN or an ISBN. So it needed to have a DOI for us to be able to do that parent-child mapping. And Dimitri Mazarin noted, I wonder if we discover all numbers in texts and try to make sense of them, we might be able to get real page numbers for most pages, which would help to connect publications by pages to BHL titles. Well, they have BHL page IDs, but the actual, so you can't say this, this platypus article starts on page 15 of the article in a citation, it just doesn't have a page number. It has a plate number, but not a page number. And here's Connie, a really- you have someone with their hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the document and I can't see what's, what's happening actually in the, okay. Um, can I see that person? Yes, I can. Thanks for telling me, um, Peter. Yeah, do you want to ask I, I just, question? yeah, I just typed my question also in the Google Doc. But it's basically about: is there a tool to batch map like a lot of uh, citations to DOIs? I've 
tens of thousands of references which I would like to map to DOIs. How do I do that? Crossref, um, which is the registration agency for digital object identifiers for literature, um, has a mapping tool so you can actually drop. So that's how they add DOIs to a, a modern day article that is being published. They drop their citation list into a, basically a white box on the Crossref website and Crossref takes all those articles and then maps DOIs to them. And that's in fact how our BHL DOIs will be added. So any citation now that, or any reference list that has the, 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 that platypus first description in it from BHL, well, they will just drop in the citation and Crossref will say, hey, there's a DOI for that now. And it'll pop the DOI into that um, underneath <laughs> the citation. And then you just have to copy paste into the article you're publishing. So you can do the same thing if you've got lists of articles that okay. um, don't really need to publish. All right, okay, thank you. And one last question, and then we'll move on um, from Siobhan Leachman. What are the challenges that you need help with for this work? How can partners as well as volunteers assist with this type of work? Um, well, certainly the sort of work that our volunteers have been doing. Um, basically, we've been working on Rod, tails, Rod Page's long tail, all that article data. So a lot of that's been done manually, and you can see that OCR makes mistakes and makes things undiscoverable. Um, so really, I mean, it would be, there's all sorts of fabulous work around OCR. It'd be great, I think, for BHL to be able to upload corrected OCR into the BHL um, show text function where you can see the OCR text. There are often mistakes in that, particularly from historic data. So that's something, that's an opportunity in the future that we, we could do. We could upload corrected OCR corrected by volunteers. But certainly that collection of article level metadata um, in the first place has been such an important piece of work that our volunteers are doing over this period of lockdown. We, there is no end in sight to when I can have my volunteers back and I can't, haven't been in the office for quite some time. So we're all doing this. I can send you more. Thank you, Nicole. That was really interesting. Awesome. Thank you for listening. Joel Richard, who's going to talk about improving taxonomic name finding in the Biodiversity Heritage Library. So Joel. Hello, uh, I am Joel Richard. I am the uh, technical coordinator for the Biodiversity Heritage Library. And in uh, my alter ego, I'm also the head of web and IT at the Smithsonian Libraries. Um, I've been at the libraries for 10 years and I've been working uh, with BHL off and on for many of those years. And in the past two years, I've been officially the technical coordinator for, uh, for the BHL. Um, this is a brief history of the, 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 the names in BHL to give us uh, a starting point uh, before we move into the uh, deep and mysterious world of, of computer code and language analysis. Um, launched in 2007, uh, BHL has had uh, scientific names identified in its uh, content for many of those years. Um, however, as we have mentioned multiple times in these talks today, um, the OCR is the foundation of the finding of those names and our OCR historically was not very accurate and while it is becoming more accurate as time goes on, um, we still have many items in VHL that were OCR'd poorly compared to what they are today. We'll come back to that. Um, for many years, I will say eight to ten years, uh, the name finding algorithms in VHL didn't receive any updates uh, in terms of the software that we were using to find the names on a scanned page. And, and hence, the names that were found were found incorrectly, were expanded incorrectly, but many of them were also correct. Otherwise, none of us would be able to use BHL on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, in my own experience, uh, and I'm not a taxonomist, I'm computer science by, by training, um, I was looking for a particular species and I couldn't find it. And I couldn't find it because the OCR was incorrect. Um, not that the name wasn't found, it was found throughout VHL, but not in the original description of, of that particular species. So this is in a way important to me because I've had direct experience uh, with it. Um, in 2015, the Global Names Architecture Group announced a new, this new scientific name detection software called GN Parser. And about a year later, they uh, released GN Finder. And these are two tools that are command line based programs that we use in Linux to parse the content and, and an attempt to identify scientific names in BHL. When we have, when we reran all of the BHL corpus, the 58 million pages that Nicole mentioned, um, we received these numbers. Um, 
240 million names are identified in, in DHL. That is, if one name appears on 10 pages, then that counts for 10. Um, the unique names that were identified by Gene Finder were 34 million. But one of the final steps of the process is to ver is of that process is to verify the names against the databases that are made available online, such as GBIF, Catalog of Life, Index Animalium, which is not exactly a database, but it is a source of names, Encyclopedia of Life, and many others. There are possibly well over a hundred that um, that the global names architecture uses. So this is a uh, this is where we are today, in that. We have reprocessed all of BHL. All of the new content coming into, into BHL on a weekly basis is also processed against these new algorithms. So how does it work? Whoops, I went too far. I'm so sorry. Uh, we, we all, I'm assuming that we are all expert users of BHL and therefore we know about the scientific name search on the advanced search page. And we also have examples here. Uh, when we find um, a page of content, we have the scientific names down at the bottom, uh, which are now uh, linked differently than they were before. And I will, I will circle back around to this later on in the talk. Um, in this case, we have both um, uh, the binomial names and the, uh, what is it, genera? I'm not a taxonomist. I don't know the right, the right words for this. But we have uh, five that were identified on this particular page. Um, moving forward, how does it work exactly? Um, this is not an easy process. Um, and again, I'm talking about the work of others. Uh, Dimitri Mazarin, uh, who is on, who's watching this call right now and who has his own presentation at, at Tadwig, um, he is the, the, the keystone of this project as, as far as I can tell and as far as I'm concerned, he is a rock star. Um, this wouldn't be possible without the work of the Global Names Architecture. Um, they look to the databases online uh, to collect the names that are listed on those sites, taking those as the authority. Those are brought into the Global Names Index. On the BHL side, he developed a piece of software that would process all of BHL for us. Um, having a direct connection to the content um, in BHL on our own servers was much more efficient than trying to use our API or, you know, try to grab 58 million pages of content over the internet. So instead of bringing the content to him, he brought the code to us. So once the names or potential names are identified on a page through the GN Finder um, process, they are uh, saved in this uh, Postgres database. PostgreSQL is an open source database. It is a competitor to MySQL and also Microsoft SQL Server. Um, that is a sort of a staging ground for the verification of the names. Once those names are verified, we then import them into BHL, including the page number on which uh, the names occur, are, occur, and also um, a few of the sources online where those names were found. We decided that it was unfeasible and very expensive to try to store every, um, every data source online that contains that name. And again, I will circle back around to this, but our initial calculations were that would be hundreds of millions of combinations because many of these databases contain the same um, taxon name that, you know, that we found on a page. So one entry on one page would incur many, many uh, records in our database. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I can really explain what's happening as it's trying to find the names on the page. This is a deep and mysterious world to me. And again, with my background in computer science, I do understand this, but it's kind of hard to explain. There is language processing going on. There is identification of things that might be a binomial name, might be a scientific name. There's a lot of name and string matching going on. Uh, there is a um, how do I describe it? sort of like a confidence level in whether or not this, this particular phrase that was found is a scientific name. There are also challenges uh, because um, some names may not be scientific names or they may collide or be the same as person names or place names, in fact. And I'll have an example of that in my next, my next slide. So the benefit to all of this is that we feel that there is more accuracy in our results. 
How do we know this? Well, we had fewer names found. And initially you would think, oh, that's, that sounds terrible. You found fewer names in BHL. That, I'm not gonna find what I'm looking for, but what I think what's really happening is that we're more accurate in what we've found. There are fewer mistakes uh, found in the OCR content. And again, that OCR word just came up, so we'll come back to that on the next slide. Um, the biggest, biggest, biggest improvement here is the speed of the processing. In the past, processing all 57, 58 million pages of BHL took a month of computing time. Now we could have distributed this across many computers and, and, and done all that work to use dozens of computers to, to do the processing. But part of it stemmed from the actual code that was being used and how that code worked. So the Global Aims Architecture team rewrote that in a new language that is much more scalable and much faster. And now today we can, we can accomplish what took a month in one day of time. And even in that sense, that, that time could be reduced further by um, more uh, improvements in speed for actually accessing those 58 million files of OCR content that represent the, the content of BHL. And then finally, since we can now process all of BHL faster, when we make a BHL wide change to the content, we can then reprocess for scientific names much quicker and have those results online faster. In fact, we're about 70% of the way of making that particular reprocessing procedure automated, that we just start it, run away, come back a day or two later, and all of BHL is ready to be put online. So as we improve OCR, which has now come up twice in our talks this, this afternoon or this morning, um, as we improve OCR and as data sources online are updated, then we can reprocess BHL and find those things that were missing in the past, like the one that I was looking for as my example earlier. Um, an improvement in OCR, an improvement in um, the data sources means that BHL gets better and better. And there will be a point, I believe that there will be a point where the OCR engines are good enough to be basically, there's going to come a point where OCR is done. That's what I believe, because some of the early tests that I've had uh, with some of the newest OCR tools have come out almost perfect in terms of the, the content found on the page and the strange characters that might appear. Granted, it's an early test, so we don't know how it's going to react to, say, other languages besides English. Um, the last piece of this puzzle was to provide a link out from BHL to the source that the name was, the source of the name on the web. So in this case, we have Tetrapteryx, which I'm not exactly sure what it is. I believe it's a, I don't know. I'm not gonna guess what it is. Um, Tetrapteryx was found uh, in the Encyclopedia of Life, Index Animalium, Ion, and, and UBIO. Um, as we uh, click through, our process found alternate, alternate um, names for this particular taxon. And these are the result of the databases we use. So we thought it was, we felt it was best to provide all the potential options, even if they're a little confusing, and even if they offer different results, not all in the same place, we felt it was best to offer these to the user because it is no extra cost to us to, to present this. Um, to present these options as you're browsing through BHL. We do see that we have Tetrapteryx Thunberg 1819 with and without the comma. Uh, that is again due to the, uh, the databases that we're using through global names. Now I have to say that this pop-up here is coming from the global names architecture uh, group again. It is the global names resolver. So we submit the name that we found on our page to Tetrapteryx and then when the results come back, and this happens in real time while you're looking at BHL, when the results come back, we display what they have. I'm not saying they're to blame, they're not, but there are different, uh, different uh, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Different conventions to how these names are, are stored in various databases. Again, we're giving the, the, the choice to the user as to which uh, they prefer. And if you look carefully, you'll see that Tetrapteryx is an in indexed organism names and also 
to chapter Stenberg 1819 is also there. So that name appears both uh, twice in, in, that, uh, in that particular database. So it's a deep and mysterious world. Um, it works very well though. I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with, with how this has turned out. It was a long process of working with the global names team to, to use BHL as a testing ground for their work, but then also to turn around and implement that uh, and, 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 and run it against BHL and uh, improve this for everyone. I think I'm out of slides. There we go. Um, finally, the future of, of the name finding project, I suppose, is OCR improvement. That is the biggest and most foundational piece of this puzzle. Um, OCR technology has improved greatly. Um, there, there are now machine learning pieces to that puzzle in which even more mysterious things happen. Um, I know that the Tesseract project, which is an open source uh, OCR engine, has been adopted by Google as uh, one of their projects and they've introduced machine learning to it and it is remarkably accurate. Um, I know that in the past we have sent volumes of, of, of content, we at the Smithsonian Library sent volumes of, of uh, taxonomic literature too to be OCR corrected by hand. And now we have the potential to do this through machine code much faster and just as accurate. And then finally, uh, this disambiguation, uh, I mentioned earlier that there are confidence levels to what um, the global names uh, GN finder code uh, uses. Um, in this case, we have Celestrina Lucia, which is a butterfly, St. Lucia, which is an island country, and Lucia, which is all on its own. And two of these appear in BHL. Can you guess which one? Um, but there is some interesting disambiguations to be made here. Uh, in, in, the case, in this particular case, Lucia on its own can be searched in BHL as a scientific name. That may or may not be accurate. It comes up, at least in the few tests I looked at, looked at as St. Lucia, as the island. However, Celestrina Lucia, or Lucia, um, also appears in BHL. So we're going to continue looking at that to see if there are ways to improve that. But there were a number of um, situations that we saw where there is this fuzzy area between, are we sure or are we not sure? And in, the case, in that case, we did lean towards it, including the things that we're not quite sure about, even if they may be not as accurate as we would prefer. So the future of name finding is challenging, but promising. And then finally, I, I, cannot, I cannot finish without giving credit to, to the team at the Global Names Architecture. They, again, are rock stars. The, the, the code that they're writing is in some ways uh, beyond my understanding because it is using tools and techniques that I just never learned in school. And they're still pushing the envelope on, on what, is, what is possible in the, the world of BHL. So uh, again, take a look at, at the work they're doing. Their code is on GitHub. They are just wonderful people to work with and I've, I've greatly enjoyed it. So thank you and I'll, I'll take any questions now. Thanks, Joel. Um, I'll try to keep an eye out for questions that have come up. I guess I'll bring up the spreadsheet. Yep. There, um, so are there, are there plans to try and visualize some of the data, say per a given text in reference to a conversation um, you had with um, someone with at the who? BHL Global Names Hackathon? <laughs> uh, who wrote that? <laughs> I didn't say, I'm sorry, <laughs> unless it was. Uh, it's possible. Um, I would be interested in, in, in uh, who the, oh, it's Debbie. Hi, Deb. Oh, okay. Um, possibly. Um, I'm still interested in, in, in really pushing the OCR side of things. Um, it's, it's, as Elisa mentioned in her, in her talk, OCR improvement is one of the things we're looking at for um, the, the technical roadmap for BHL. And I think it's one of the higher priority items. Everything we do from picking out titles to articles of, of platypuses or um, identifying other citations requires accurate OCR. And that I think is the first thing that we should probably focus on in the, in the coming year. Let's see. And let me, let me just say, there's a plug here from Dimitri Mazarin. Jeff Owen, Ower and I did some work on making names in BHL more useful. I'll talk about it tomorrow. 
in what symposium? Symposium nine, technical and standards implica implications in data liberation and semantic publishing for biodiversity. So- I should also say that okay. Dima gave a, a talk at Biodiversity Next, I think last year, that also covers this topic of how they, they process BHL and, and work on Yeah. And then um, um, Nikki Nicholson asks, have you usage statistics on how much the name navigation route into BHL is used? Right. I do not have that immediately at, immediately at hand. However, it's a very good question. Usually see people asking some page references. Yeah, the scientific name search is hidden for new BHL user, but I don't, I don't have immediate statistics, Nikki, on, on how many people are coming in through that uh, scientific name landing page, so to speak. And then David Shorthouse asks, would it be possible then to make use of hypothesis.is for crowdsourced annotations of scientific names on BHL pages that would then feed improvements to name finding BHL wide? I see the plus one up here for that. Um, yes, and I, also the, um, the crowdsource annotations ties into the IIIF discussion uh, from earlier. I, th I think there, there's this common a few common threads of the things that, that would benefit BHL greatly. And, and one of those is that, that annotation. And I need to be more familiar with hypothesis.is. This is Martin, if you don't mind me just jumping in there, Joel. Sure. Um, also, I, I saw <clears throat> Dan Whaley from Hypothesis is on the Twitter stream. Um, we did do a BHL presentation on, on annotations in another context at one of the past Hypothesis conferences. Um, and there's a lot of possibilities there. So um, it'd be great to continue to work with Hypothesis and, and Dan and his team on certain things as we go forward. Okay. And Dimitri Shigel makes a comment um, regarding um, using, a, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the IP address is in, in uh, reference to, but he says he has a guess that BHL has become an always there free default service for users, for instance, in Russia. And he'd be curious about some user stats by countries, regions. I guess it was re right. referring to user stats. We do have some of that statistics already. Yeah. And I would also like to say that, um, Going back to Elisa's talk, and again, the, the OCR question, um, really good OCR, exceptionally good OCR even, uh, would almost make BHL usable in a very low bandwidth situation. If we don't need to deliver the image of a page and we can deliver very clean text, then that is a route to a, a, a very low bandwidth um, BHL. So again, we're, we're back to that the question of OCR and our OCR is good. It is not great, but it is good. Um, I would like to see it great. Okay. Uh, you know, so Nikki People Nicholson click, yes. again notes that he uses, yeah. or BHL is used a lot, but never by scientific name. Other entities detected in the text would be useful like people, collection codes, places, et cetera. Right. And Funny that's on thing. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that, 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 yeah, here's, okay, that's Dimitri Siegel. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm reading and trying to talk at the same time. The global names, uh, the, the name finder, I believe can be adapted to different things to find in BHL. Um, so if we have a database of geographic names, we could throw that through at BHL through the global, the global names finder, the GN finder tool. So it's not, I don't think it's strictly limited to scientific names. It may be optimized for scientific names, but that's certainly a possibility for, for finding geographic names and people names as mentioned earlier today. Places, yes. Mm -hmm. Toponyms, yes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. I'm serious here. I think we got all the questions. Um, so it is time to move on uh, to our last talk and maybe we can pick up some of these discussions at the Biodiversity Heritage Library and the global COVID-19 pandemic.
Hello, everybody, and let me just make sure <clears throat> I think. Do you see a presentation on the screen? Yes. Great. Okay. Well, thank you again for insert your time zone here attending the session today. Um, there have been a number of great questions, and we can definitely follow up on some of those over time. Um, today, um, I'm going to present on behalf of my colleagues, um, Connie, Jane Smith, David Eagleton, and Colleen, on some of the responses that BHL has made to the global pandemic. So um, again, many of us know, again, having been most of us users of BHL, how BHL really is um, the um, go-to source, as some of you have said, for a lot of the key taxonomic literature going back 500 plus years. Um, and again, the, as also has been noted, there's been a lot of uh, change to the way taxonomy is done, thanks to having this ready access to this open content. And again, um, changing just the status quo. And I think this is one of the key takeaways that we've had from this COVID crisis, again, is how having accessibility to this content has proven invaluable. So as everyone knows, BHL is a global consortium with our 20 members, 22 affiliates, and our content providers all around the world. I'd like to highlight this particular quote from Connie, which was um, from our annual meeting, which again went virtual in um, earlier this year, um, which again was expressing how BHL's ecosystem really always has been a virtual environment. We really have, from the very beginning, worked in a distributed manner. And I think Connie's um, quote here really sort of captured that element of BHL's um, virtualness. And just sort of highlighting some of these key elements again uh, that Connie was pointing out, um, the virtual virtualness of DHL, the globalness, the partnerships and collaboration, the resiliency that our partners showed during the crisis, and again, making all of this scientific information available in an open manner. And again, as Connie noted, BHL really does epitomize in many ways open science. So again, what is in BHL? Here's sort of our, some of our more current updates where we should be ticking over to 59 million pages sometime soon. Had we not had to stop scanning, we would have already done that. Um, we are, as many of our partners are beginning to scan again, we're inching up again towards that. But what happened with all of these libraries when the COVID crisis struck and the world went into lockdown? I have a quote here from Chris Freeland, our um, original BHL technical director now at the Internet Archive, who has noted how many books in the US alone in just public libraries were suddenly inaccessible. And with 600, 700 million books were suddenly no longer accessible to users just in the US, when you expand that globally, we're talking billions of books that were no longer available, except in the lucky cases <clears throat> when those had been digitized. We did some research and it went, followed a lot of the different types of research that had been being done on the impact of COVID on research globally. Um, these are just a few of the many reports that came out from academic organizations that tracked the different ways that, in, that research was going to be impacted during this crisis. And here we just have some photos from some of our BHL partners showing what our libraries, our physical libraries look like during the COVID crisis. There you can see Connie visiting the Museum of Comparative Zoology Library, socially distanced and appropriately masked. The Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew with nary a reader in sight. And then from London, we did have Charles Darwin was able to visit the Natural History Museum Library where he sort of lives on a regular basis in a sort of static mode and notice his PPE and cleanup supplies are right there handy. Mm -hmm. This sh um, slide shows graphically the shutdown in scanning uh, from January of 2020 through October 2020. And you can see how in um, April, pretty much scanning stopped. The increase in September was actually due to some of our partners starting back up again, as well as a number of our partners uploading previously digitized content or some born digital content that again are um, 
staff who are working from home <clears throat> were able to get that content that had been previously digitized and then um, upload that or the born digital content. So we did see that uptick and the October stats are a little low primarily because the when the capture of this data. Um, here is um, a survey, some results of a survey that we had done of our partners um, at sort of the midpoint of the COVID crisis. Um, and these were the different ways that people in our different organizations were responding. So we talked about um, how the partners were responding to the crisis in terms of expanding access to digital content, increased demand on demand digitization, and a lot of virtual trainings in BHL. Um, we also talked about the, so, the <clears throat> reopening strategy for our physical spaces. Um, and that included, again, social distancing, appointment only access, curbside services, and delivery of physical materials to um, their users. One of the big successes of BHL in terms of a global partnership during the COVID crisis, though, was to provide impactful and valuable telework to partners and their staff around the world who were unable to work in their regular buildings, but could actually be providing metadata enhancement. A lot of this, like a lot of things Nicole was talking about with her volunteers. Um, so we organized projects for metadata cleanup, image uploading, et cetera. Oops. Um, um, to um, help those staff have um, good work to do during this time. Here's just a quick little snapshot I did of some of the metadata improvements. This was pagination that occurred in BHL. So this is where people were actually adding page numbers and all that other information that makes BHL content more findable. So you can see in the January, September period of a year ago, there are under 2000 items done and that picked up to 2200 and the big number is the number of pages done so you can see we almost doubled the number of pages paginated during that time period because of the number of staff we had working on metadata improvement the other important element that we did was we were doing image identification within bhl <clears throat> and adding those materials to our Flickr stream which will again be repurposable over time in a different number of different bhl ways and we had um, eight different partners from eight different institutions representing 38 staff uploading Flickr content. Oops. Oops. And that um, increased um, our total number of, uh, they uploaded over 60,000 images to Flickr during that time. So again, the clear lessons learned in terms of employing staff and keeping them at work at this time, um, we need clear communications on projects, improved account management, mentorship and training, addressing discrepancies in workload across projects. Some things are harder than others. Um, and we chose projects that had existing documentation, could be performed by staff with varying skill levels, and were not necessarily a top priority, but would be quickly adaptable and provide impact. And I'd like to give a special credit to Grace Costantino and Bianca Crowley on the BHL Secretariat who really helped um, make these projects work from a central point of view, as well as Jacqueline Chapman at the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives, who really did a great job in terms of um, getting a lot of these um, staff up and going and helping with them. So our BHL user community, how did that change during the crisis? <clears throat> Um, in 2020, we have seen seven of the top 10 all-time usage months occur since the COVID crisis, um, and our average monthly users um, increased significantly. Um, this is a nice graphic representation, and you can sort of picture, you can see the COVID crisis roughly occurring at the beginning of the um, I have a pointer. Um, you can see the COVID crisis in terms of page views um, increasing during that. And then <clears throat> now as time is going on, we're getting back to our sort of uh, more regular usage levels, but still with an increase overall. Two minutes, Martin. Okay. Um, quick slide on to total users on um, the key things here. Again, the overall increase of 12%. Um, this is year over year. Um, I saw an interesting statistic I noted, though, was our top five user regions by country 
four of those actually saw declining overall use year over year with only India showing an increase. So that increase was actually coming from sort of the long tail of users, which is interesting. So this can use a little bit more analysis um, to see exactly where those statistics um, have, where the meaning is. Um, BHL's commitment to open access did it well during this time. Um, and these are just some quotes, which I won't read from our BHL partners, showing how the BHL membership really directly benefited the users in those institutions. And again, from our Twitter community, again, people thanking BHL for the different availability of materials where they could not reach those in their physical libraries. And some more of the same. And I just like to sort of end with this quote from um, Dr. Helen Hartley from Q, um, again, where the work of IPNI was continuing on even during the crisis when she could not get into the, the garden itself to the library there. But again, BHL um, facilitated her work. So thank you very much for spending this time with us today. Um, our authors and their orchids. And we do have a little brief bibliography at the end of the, the presentation in case you wanna read some of those other impact on research um, things. So thank you very much. And I will thank turn you, off share screen. Um, we have time for questions for Martin and then we can, we can have further discussions about other questions as well. I'll check the document. Your microphone should be on so you could jump in with a question if you if you want. There's a lot of discussion about AI in the in the chat. This is Annie Simpson from USGS. Um, I've always really, really appreciated BHL. I'm not at all surprised you had so many uh, accolades that you could put on the screen. I was wondering, and I, I did log on late, I apologize, but did you mention any difficulties with ongoing funding or are you in a comfortable place? Um, I don't think any nonprofit is ever in a comfortable place financially, but um, right now BHL is still doing well. Um, we are in continuous conversations with our partners in terms of our uh, membership renewal, which will begin um, in the start of the new year. The Smithsonian is also remains a very um, robust partner in terms of financial support. Um, so um, right now we're still feeling um, that it is in a good place right now for um, funding for BHL. But again, as the economic crisis continues to hit um, nonprofits and scientific institutions, um, we are being careful with um, where we're spending. Oh, there's a question from David Shorthouse. Um, what has happened with the legal issues at Internet Archive and does BHL have the capacity to make a go without Internet Archive if need be? So um, Dave is referring specifically probably to the recent lawsuit against the Internet Archive related to their emergency um, digital library, which was related to in copyright books. Um, we all see how that plays out in time through the courts. Um, however, we um, strongly continue to strongly support the Internet Archive. But I think as Joel might have mentioned, we do also have uh, backup storage of all of BHL at the Smithsonian. Um, we are planning on using that for our, eventually for our IIIF implementation because we'll need to serve those from a closer to BHL source. So um, we um, continue to strongly support the Internet Archive, but um, we do have a backup plan for eventually serving, which will also 
assist with those um, places where Internet Archive might be blocked for various reasons. For instance, um, China has difficulty sometimes seeing BHL images that are being served from IA. Um, Diane Rellinger asked, um, the improved OCR that was mentioned, does it include difficult fonts such as Fractor? I will defer to Elisa on this. She has more experience. Yeah, let Elisa. <laughs> right. So um, Fracture is always uh, challenging, but um, my latest experience with, especially with Tesseract, was quite fine. Um, it's not perfect and it's not as, as good as um, we have with, with, with normal Latin text, but um, it was definitely better than, let's say, five years ago. Yeah, there's, there's great improvements happening there. Uh, is there a similar a project similar to IIIS for publications? Is that correct? Yeah. A pro is there a similar to IIIF project for publications? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand. Can, can, maybe Dimitri could just get on here and talk to <laughs> us. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll try. Um, I, I'm working now with uh, uh, matching. Um, references from Catalog of Life to BHL references. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what I find that uh, quite often we do find connection. And the problem with this, uh, there is a, a string that is in Catalog of Life, not parsed. And there is a, uh, the, the same publication in BHL. So we connected these two. But if we have a slightly different string with the same publication, it's not connected anymore. So it would be really great if there is a um, authoritative resource that is able to uh, connect all these different strings and all these different places where publications happen in one place. So like if, uh, so I would need to match uh, like a reference string with BHL, mm -hmm. and this data would uh, automatically connect all other strings that exist for this particular uh, publication, and all the people would get this connection to BHL. You know what I mean? That's certainly a conversation to be had there. I think it might play into some other things I've been thinking about too. But I think to answer your question, no. Because <laughs> <laughs> AAA, I mean, yeah. It's an interesting question though, yeah. So we have another comment and question from Nikki Nicholson. Um, GBIF has the Young Researcher Prize and the Ebby Nielsen Challenge, which help publicize the data available for the network and draw, draw in contributions from other disciplines. Would BHL consider this kind of activity? It's potentially a big resource for computer science research, for example, though maybe not a great follow-up from the recent question Ray concerns about funding. Um, um, Nikki, yes, um, we have, um, you know, we've mentioned the BHL hackathon. We have thought about how we could do some sort of prizes for um, doing this kind of work. So it's a, it's a good um, <clears throat> area to continue to explore. So um, yes, and in fact, Connie, didn't, I think we mentioned that somewhere in our strategic implementation plan. Yes. But, so I think that is sort of on the, the roadmap. And then Dimitri um, Shigel has another question. Um, we discussed BHL Europe content that was planned to be processed at some point to make it discoverable through BHL portal. Any news here? I'm especially curious about Cyrillic content. So I can answer a little bit about the European content. I, there's no Cyrillic content at the moment. The European content that's being worked on currently is from um, the Paris Museum. And we only just regained access to the data. Um, and so we have to have conversations um, with, since we aren't doing that ourselves, we're doing that in conjunction with the information, well, with, with the museums that, that provided the content. Um, so we are working on that glacially still. Um, but again, for most of the lockdown, that content, the content that we have was not available. Let's see, any other questions? 
<clears throat> see a question from Deb uh, Paul about the Abbey Fracture package. Um, yes, indeed, that is true. Um, however, um, the Fracture package is an add-on cost um, than the Internet Archive, which does supply our um, our um, OCR, OCR. At no at no, OCR at no cost. Um, does not currently have the Fracture package. We've talked to them about it, but it's a bit too pricey for them to purchase at the scale they're doing. So I think we will have to look at other options as Alyssa is thinking for that, as mentioned. And just to add, um, the the Fracture from, from Abby um, works fine, but yet um, the open source uh, solutions are still better um, during some tests we did. And there's another um, question in the document. Pl are there plans for more unpublished archival resources in BHL and inclusion of more smaller collections, particularly from institutions that aren't focused on biodiversity? I can take the first part. Um, one of the work at home projects that the Smithsonian is focusing on is uploading to BHL the hundreds if not thousands of field notes that we have digitized but not yet uploaded to BHL. So um, shortly we'll be starting to upload those many, many um, Smithsonian field notes to BHL. And that's true also at MCZ, at the MCZ library. One of the projects we've been working on is getting all of the field notes um, and correspondence that we've, we've digitized uploaded and getting the transcriptions that have that are being completed at a rather rapid rate during this COVID time into BHL as well. But, so it's essentially corrected OCR or OCR. Well, there is no OCR for those handwritten notes, but now there will be transcriptions. And so they're searchable just like everything else. Hmm. All right, let me go back to the document. And Diane is noting that a number of BHL partners are uploading archival materials and primary source material. Let's see, I don't see any hands up. We have two minutes, are there any other questions? Hi, Bianca. Well, I want to thank all the, the people who helped with um, keeping this, this um, symposium on track. Holly Little and Ellie Wallace and Colleen were the behind the scenes making sure everything was working and reminding me when I missed something. So thanks so much, I, especially um, Ellie, who was up rather early for this. And thanks to all the attendees as well. And the volunteers, yes. <laughs>